Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome for Professor Danny Kwa. Hello there, hello there, and welcome to LSE's Big Questions Lecture. This afternoon, what I'd like to talk to you about is perhaps the largest single economic event in your lifetime, and actually in my lifetime as well. And what that is, is the great shift east in the global economy. And what we're going to do is use economics to try and understand some of the large changes in the world surrounding us. We're going to use economics to try and help us think through this great shift east. Now to begin, how many people here know what economics is? How many people here have some idea about what the economy is? So if I could just see a show of hands and we'll get, get a round of answers to this question. What is an economy? What is economics? An answer here. So yes, please. I think economics means financially based. It's, a set, it's the financial sector of what we deal with. Yeah. It's savings and investment. It's uh, the stock market that we see around it. So it's financial based. Any other answers? Anybody, any other thoughts on what an economy is? Yes. It's also about like the downfall of like money and everything, like being presented on graphs and everything, like seeing everything like going up, going down, like putting together results and everything. It has to do with movements in the value of money, the goods and services, the stuff that we can buy with money. So economics is about finances and it's about money and it's about buying stuff and selling stuff. It's what economists might think of as goods and services. Now, the stuff has to come from somewhere. And when stuff gets produced, that too is part of the economy. So the production of stuff is part of the economy. And when there's buying and selling that goes on, we go away with the stuff that we've bought and we enjoy it. We consume it. We eat up the food that we've just bought. So economics is about buying and selling stuff that's valuable. And when we say the economy, what we're thinking about is the sum total of all the stuff that's produced, that's sold, that's bought, and that's enjoyed by the people in the society. It's the sum total of all of this stuff. That's what the economy is. So when we say the UK economy, we're thinking of all the stuff that's made here, all the stuff that's consumed here, all the buying and selling that happens on the high street, in supermarkets, when you take the London underground, when you ride coaches, when you've just had your lunch and you've bought sandwiches and drinks, all of that is part of the economy. And the things in an economy that get produced are produced by businesses. Businesses hire people, they employ people, workers work at making stuff, they earn money, and then they buy things with it. So all of that is the flow of stuff in an economy. So we have a picture of what an economy is. There's employment that happens, and the buying and selling happens in markets. Okay. Economic growth is what happens when the economy increases in size, whether it increases in size because there's a greater flow of stuff, or whether it increases in size because the stuff that's being produced has become more and more valuable. Economic growth happens throughout the world. Now, in the United Kingdom, in many Western economies, economic growth occurs in the East, which is what we're going to be thinking about in a second, looking at in a second. Economic growth happens. The way we measure economic growth is in percentage rates of change per year. Now, it so happens that the UK economy and most advanced <coughs> industrial Western economies grow at about 2% a year. Growth is different in different parts of the world. To help us think about this, to help us think about what economic growth looks like, I'm going to now go through a simple exercise with different members of the audience. So if I could have <coughs> Jasper from this side of the audience, if I could have Jasper come down on stage to help us. A big round of applause, please, for Jasper. <laughs> Jasper here is going to help us think about 
economic growth in the United Kingdom. Jasper, welcome. Yeah. Um, could you tell us, to begin, um, where you're going to school, what kind of things you enjoy? Uh, I go to Fortis Smith School in Muswell Hill, and yeah, I enjoy doing PE. Uh, I also like making things in DT. That's Very good. Yeah. So yeah, you enjoy PE and you're athletic yeah. kind of schoolboy. How tall are you today? Uh, about five foot five. About five foot five, okay. Jasper, if I could just have you standing here for a second. If I could now have, from this side of the room, Ali. If Ali could come down. Big round of applause for Ali. <laughs> Ali, welcome. Welcome to the LSE. If I could just have, have you standing over here, please. Now, could you tell us where you go to school, what kinds of things you enjoy? Uh, I go to Ford Smith School in Muswell Hill. I enjoy music and science. And about how tall would you say you are? Uh, about six foot. Six foot tall. And you'll notice he is six foot tall because I put the microphone way too low and he constantly had to go like this to speak into the microphone. He is six foot tall. Now I've brought these two young men down here to illustrate a point. I told you that the UK economy is growing at about 2% a year. The average 10 year old in the United Kingdom is five feet tall. So for a 10 year old who is five feet tall, to grow to five feet five at the end of key stage three, a period of four years, that young man will have grown at 2% a year. So when you see, when you look at Jasper here, you can think Jasper is growing at the same rate that the United Kingdom economy is growing. <laughs> well done, Jasper. <laughs> On this side of the room, I've got Ali. Ali is taller, Ali is six feet tall. And if Ali had been, the same height as an average 10 year old four years ago when he was 10, then to go from five feet tall to six feet tall in the course of four years, he will have grown at 4.6% a year. So you see the difference between growth at 2% a year, growth at 4.6% a year. That is a range of growth rates that we see around the world. But actually, there's more to the global economy. So, Thank you very much, Jasper and Ali. If you could return to your seat, good round of applause. When I say there's more to the global economy, there are countries in the world that are growing at rates different from 2% or 4.6%, obviously. One of those countries that receives a lot of attention is China. So I would like to hear some guesses about what the growth rate of China has been for the last 15, 20 years. Is it growing like the United Kingdom at 2% a year? Or is it growing like Ali at 4.6% a year? So if I could have some guesses about the growth rate of the Chinese economy. Um, I think it's about 6%. About 6% a year. Excellent guess. But notice, 6% a year is already a growth rate that's faster than Ali was. And Ali was already six feet tall. Any other guesses on what China might have been doing? The gentleman over there. 10%. 10% a year. Yeah. Think about what you're saying now. We've just seen the UK, powerful economy, growing at 2% a year. We've seen Ali growing at practically a chemical reaction, 4.6% a year. Someone's already guessed 6%, and you're guessing? 10%. 10%. The lady in front? 13%. 13% a year. Now, we're really going stratospheric now. Good guesses from everyone. The right answer, it turns out, this is a factual question. China has been growing at 10% a year. So well done you, but well done everyone who's guessed 6% or 13% because that is the range of numbers we're thinking about when we're looking at countries out there, other than the United Kingdom. Let's think for a second what 10% growth a year means. 10% growth means a doubling in size every seven years. It means that if Jasper here had been growing at the same rate as China, then today, when he came up, he would be seven feet too tall if he had been growing at the same rate as China. If he were growing at the same rate as China, by the time this young man attends his first LSE lectures, comes to the LSE to study economics, he will be 10 feet tall. <laughs> That's the kind of growth rates that we're talking about in this great shift east in the global economy. 
when we're talking about the largest single economic event of your lifetime, we're talking about countries in the world, economies in the world, growing at phenomenal rates, growing faster than even Ali. Okay. This great shift east is what is happening out there. We've understood how heights help us illustrate economic growth. What I now want to do is turn to how apply these lessons to thinking more about the great shift east. These very different growth rates are totally reshaping the global economy. So to think about this, let's think about what the global economy is. Well, here's how we might ease into this. Economic value is created where people work. They're employed by businesses. They're making stuff. Where people work is also where they live and also where they play. And where people work and play at night, there is light. Light like the kind that you see in this picture. This is a picture taken by satellites surrounding our planet. And it's a false image photograph that shows the nighttime sky over a 48 hour period of our planet 30 years ago. 30 years ago, if you stepped off our planet and looked, at, looked back at it, what you will see, great swaths of light in North America, great swaths of light over the United Kingdom and Western Europe. Yes, there are some lights elsewhere. There's a bright splash of light way on the east of the planet in Japan, bright splash of light through the Indian subcontinent, and then patches of light in different places. Australia here turns out to be relatively dark. Most of the world turns out to be relatively dark in the sense that there's very little light. Now we can use this picture, we can understand, use this picture to try and think about how the global economy is shifting. And 30 years ago, what we see is that the global economy was mostly North America and Western Europe. Now, when I look at this picture, I ask myself, is there a center to the world economy? The answer 30 years ago is that there probably was. And if I balance out all the different lights everywhere, all the lights that are intense in North America, the lights that are intense in Western Europe and further east, a pretty good guess for what the center of the world economy is given by this picture. There's a red triangle superimposed on the previous picture, and it points us to where the center of the world economy was most likely mid-Atlantic. That point is the one that balances out economic activity everywhere. To think about and try and understand the 8-9% growth rate in the East that we've just seen, the comparison with what we see in growth rates elsewhere, what I'd like to do is to think about how this picture is changing. And what we're going to do to help us understand how this picture is changing is some volunteers from the audience. So if I could have four volunteers altogether, two volunteers from this side, if you could just put up your hand and then come, up, come down on stage. So these two gentlemen, the two gentlemen who've got their hands up, please come on down. Big round of applause. So, welcome, welcome gentlemen. So if I could have you standing over here, if you'll hang on just a second, I'll assemble the rest of our Great Shift East in the Global Economy Mastermind team. So if I could have two people from this side of the audience, yes, the lady up there, and someone else. Someone else, anyone else? Yes, please, come on down. So, big round of applause for our opposing team. Come on down, welcome. If I could have you standing over here. Welcome, if I could have you standing over here. So, we're now gonna try and work out how the Great Shift East is changing the global economy. And as you can see, my assistants are putting out a rope. So, we're gonna get physical up here. First, before the fun begins, let's get to know our friends up here. So, if I could have your name, sir. Andreas. Andreas. And what kinds of things do you enjoy? Sports. On a Saturday afternoon. You like sports? And, and you like studying too? No. No, you don't like studying. <laughs> okay. Very good. And sir? Um, Stanley. Okay. Stanley. And the things that you enjoy? I like spending time with friends. Good. Thank you. For Hang on a second. And on this side, your oh, name, please? Sarah. Sarah. And you enjoy? Uh, shopping. Shopping. Excellent. You know, this is exactly what an economist wants to hear. Shopping, buying and selling stuff. Very good. And um, in school, I love maths. And maths. Excellent. So, yeah. Okay, so we'll register you for coming to the LSC in a few years. Yeah. Actually. And your name? Hi, I'm Savannah. Savannah. Yes. And you enjoy? I enjoy 
horse riding. Horse riding. And I like maths and Chinese. Excellent. Maths and Chinese. So we're doing Great Shift East right before your eyes up here. <laughs> now, if I could have the volunteers step up a bit and pick up this rope and be, act as if you are going to be doing a tug of war. We're not. We're not going to do tug of war physical competition. The game <laughs> is a little bit different. What we're going to do, as you can see, just as in for the global economy, this rope separating our two teams, joining our two teams, also has a center, and that center also has a red triangle in it. The challenge here is for the four volunteers up here to line up this red triangle with what we see on the map. OK, help me out here. Have we lined this up? No, I'm seeing signs go that way. That way? All right. I'm going to need a little bit more physical exertion from you. <laughs> So we're going to pull, if you would. And so you're coming along here, and you're hanging on to the rope. OK. So uh, are we there yet? No, we've got to go back. OK, we've got to go back. Excellent. Well done. This was the state of the global economy 30 years ago. What we know, however, is that the global economy has changed. Last year, the red triangle has shifted east. The center of the global economy the center of the world economy has shifted east. Now, we're seeing a greater pull from this team, this team representing the east side of the global economy. Are we lined up yet? No. no. OK, good. So which way are we going? Hold on to the rope tight now. OK. Yes, are we there? Excellent. Well done. So the global economy has shifted. The center of the global economy has shifted, and it shifted in this direction. On the map here, if we were actually to measure it out, it would have moved 5,000 kilometers east because of huge spectacular growth rates that we've seen occur in China, India, and the rest of the east. And if this process continues, what will happen in the next 30 years is this next red triangle. All right, team members, you now know the drill. What do you have to do to keep this red triangle in line with what's happened in the global economy? You're getting pulled this direction. Come on, guys. <laughs> OK, no, no, wait, you can't step over the center of the world economy. You're on this side. <laughs> okay. And this is how the world has changed. Please help me thank my volunteers for helping us understand the shift in global economy. Thank you very much. You can return to your seat now. Mind is how you step over the road. That is the great shift east. The center of the world economy has moved from mid-Atlantic now to right on the boundary between India and China. What exactly does it mean for you and me? How does it affect our lives? Well, one way to start thinking about how it affects our lives is to ask our friends, to actually go to you, talk to you about what's happening in your life. So I did this. here's a little something I prepared beforehand. Oh, I love my stuff. My CD plan. My computer. My football. Oh, love. My stuff, stuff, stuff. Charlie is one active young man. You saw the rate at which he went through the stuff that was in his room? Well, believe it or not, we had to slow down the camera just so we could follow him around. But what we did was we visited Charlie, and we picked out different things in his room because when we picked them up and we filmed them, we saw that on the bottom of each of these objects was the legend, Made in China. And we found a number of different things. There's Charlie's CD player. There's Charlie's Xbox. There is his computer. There is his football. And we went to the high street, and we asked, if you had to buy all these things on the high street, how much did Charlie's family pay for them? And we found that the CD player is 25 pounds. The Xbox is about 220 pounds. And we figured out what the value of things were that are part of the economy that Charlie's contributing to that all have, at the bottom of it, made in China. And then we wondered further, well, what would have happened if we hadn't bought these things from China? What would happen if these things had been made right here? And we did a bit of calculation, and what we found was this. We found 
that if his CD player had been made not in China and then bought on the high street by importing it from China, it would have cost 250 pounds. If the Xbox had been made here in the United Kingdom, it would have cost almost 2,000 pounds. Even the football that we've picked up, saw was made in China, if that had been made here in the United Kingdom, it would have cost 80 pounds. What we see is that this great shift east, when more economic activity is happening in China, what it has done is it, made, it has made prices on all of the stuff lower. It's made our cost of living fall. It's made our family incomes go a little bit further. Now, of course, this is one impact of this great shift east in the global economy. And all of these are good things. They're, they've helped us raise our standards of living. But many of us still do fear the rise of the east, this great shift east. And to help us think about this, I'm going to have the audience help me again with another role-playing scene. And I have assistants who are going to help me set the scene. What's happening is that I want you to imagine this is Saturday afternoon. Some of you want to go see friends, but there are some of you who also want to do some serious video gaming. What you see here is a shot that I hope some of you will recognize of the video game on the Xbox called Halo Reach. And to paraphrase what other people say about this, this is not just a video game. It's a complex battle simulation with a steep learning curve. It's got multiple weapons, vehicles, and strategies. It's got an extremely intricate backdrop story. What I need is somebody who really understands this, a volunteer from this side of the room. A big round of applause, please. Please, if I could have you stand over here, sir. And I'll come back to you in a second. Just hang on here. You're going to get down to some serious gaming in a second. So just relax. This will be fun. This will be fun. So I need somebody, a volunteer, to come down here and help play the mother of the house. <laughs> Anyone? Yes, please. Gen this gentleman out here, if you could <laughs> just come on out. A big round of applause, please. <laughs> welcome, welcome. So, okay, I'm going to have you standing over here, and we're going to come, down, come back to you in a second. Now, video gaming. This is what we're all here for, isn't it? So, sir, if you could tell me your name, what school you go to, and what kind of games you enjoy. Uh, my name's Tian, and Tian? I go to Sacred Heart School. Mm. Um, and what's your favorite Xbox game? Call of Duty. Excellent. I hope Halo Reach is somewhere in that pantheon of things. Excellent. Well done. Excellent. So, you know, while his name is Tian, it is well known in the video gaming community that everybody who plays Halo Reach is named Tim. So, Tim, if I could have you sit, sit down in your easy chair. Okay. Right in front of you, there's a 67-inch widescreen high-definition TV with Halo Reach loaded up, all set to go. Grab the controller because we're going to kick some serious covenant butt. <laughs> okay. So grab the controller. He's all ready to go. Now, on the other side of the room, other side of the house, Tim's mom. Okay. Tim's mom is staring back at me and wondering, what have I gotten myself into? If you could tell us your name and the things that you enjoy. Um, Ash. And Ash. I don't really play video games, but... Th that's um, fine. Most okay. moms don't. I know for a fact. <laughs> Um, watching TV and watching Facebook. TV. Excellent. So this is, that's the house. Tim's mom is looking on Facebook for the time being because there's a task that she needs to do. She realizes that Tim here is just about to get started on video gaming. And when he gets going, 10 pounds or he's not moving. He is seated and that's what he's going to do. But Tim's mom here has just checked on Facebook and she can see she's just been told there's a business opportunity come up and she's got to go to town to meet someone. And that would be excellent, except her car's all messed up. The storms over the weekend have totally fouled up her car. And what she needs to do, she's desperate. 
20 pounds for a clean car. She's so desperate that she's put aside some money for this. So we snuck into Her Majesty's printing presses over the weekend, and we printed out some special money just for our use today. So as you can see here, if I could have you holding on to that, here's a nice 10 pound note of the kind that you see on the high street. Here's a five pound note, and there are some five one pound coins. And Ash, Tim's mom, you're holding on to this because you have in mind and desperate to get a clean car, willing to pay 20 pounds for it. Tim is getting going and will not move unless he gets 10 pounds. Here's a thought. Tim's mom could suggest to Tim, you know, you could come away from that video game and actually help me, wash my car and I'll give you 10 pounds. And Tim's mom knows that if that happens, yes, he'll get the job done, but Tim really wants to keep on video gaming. And that 10 pounds will just about make him move. So to seal the case, Tim's mom says, I'll pay you 15 pounds if you wash my car right away. And here's what happens. So we take the 15 pounds from Tim's mom, who hands it, yes, please, do give it to me. I'm going to give you a clean car in return. So I've taken 15 pounds from you, and I'm running over here to Tim. I'll put this on the Xbox console, and I'll have Tim put down the controller, hold, these ten, hold, the, hold this money. We've just seen an economic transaction. We've seen a trade in a service, a car wash service. And that trade has led to an exchange, has led to an exchange imminently of 15 pounds, and is going to result in potentially a clean car. Now, in this example that we've just gone through, it's a simple car wash. It's the kind that you might see on the high street. It's the kind that you might see, well, in Tim's household. But when we're talking about the great shift east in the global economy, more complicated things happen. And to understand some of these more complicated things, I'm going to ask for another volunteer who will represent India and China entering the global marketplace, entering the world stage. If I could have a volunteer who is going to represent India and China. So from over here, from up here, a big round of applause, please, for, for India and China entering the world stage. So if I could have you come up here and stand next to this sign. Let me get the microphone so we can hear. If I could hear, have your name, please. Lauren. Lauren. And what kinds of things do you enjoy, Lauren? Shopping. Shopping. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, you know, this audience is filled with people who are going to be make really good economists. So what else do you do? Mm, seeing my friends. Seeing your friends. One of the 57%. <laughs> good company. OK. Lauren here is going to represent India and China entering the global economy. Here's, what, here's what's going to happen. Lauren, she's walking down the street, she's looking for friends, and she doesn't have any definite plans yet. But she realizes, with all the activity happening in Tim's household, something is afoot. And she realizes that because she doesn't have any plans, she, you know, she could get in on this car wash action. And so she's coming down the street, she's a little bit bored, she hasn't yet met up with her friends, and she's practically holding a sign up that says, She's keen and will wash cars for only four pounds. She doesn't even have any plans. As she comes down the street, Tim's mom realizes, hang on a second here. I wanted a clean car. I paid Tim here, who hasn't budged yet. You know, he said he was going to get 15 pounds, he was going to wash the car. He hasn't moved. He's still sitting in front of the Xbox. So Tim's mom decides, you know, stops and thinks, you know, maybe Lauren here can help me with the car wash. So I'm going to run an errand for Tim's mom. So I'm going to run over here and take back this money. I'm sorry, I'm going to take this back from you. OK, he's obviously objecting, and we're going to come back to his objections. But Tim's mom says, you know, I've got this money here, and I've got Lauren here, who's all set to wash my car for four pounds. Now, I know she's one of the neighborhood kids, you know, but hey, maybe I can cut the same kind of deal that I did with Tim. So Tim's mom says, you know what? I'm going to take up these four pounds that you were looking for, I'm going to add another five pound into the mix. I'm going to turn this around so that the queen's face is again visible. And she says to Lauren, Lauren, nine pounds if you wash my car right away. Okay. So what's just happened here? Tim's gone back to gaming. Tim's mom now sits with 11 pounds in her hands. Lauren who had nothing else to do yet until she met up with her friends, now carries nine pounds, 
which will help with the shopping that she enjoys. What's happened here is that the entrance of India and China into the global economy, the global marketplace, has benefited Tim's mom, who has now gotten a car wash on the cheap. It has benefited Lauren, who now has nine pounds to spend more on her friends and additional shopping. And Tim here has just gone back to his gaming, which is not necessarily a bad thing. A big round of applause for our volunteers. If I could just take this money back from you. Thank you very much. Thank you. A big round of applause, and you just go back to your seats. Let's summarize the lessons of what we've just gone through. Exchange, even exchange on the high street, even exchange within the family, benefits all sides to the transactions, brings gains for everyone involved in the transaction. When India and China or other places in the East enter the global marketplace, they become potential competition. And this potential competition can undercut more traditional exchanges that we're, due, that we're used to on the high street. Lauren benefited from this exchange, just as China, India, the rest of the East have benefited. Tim's mom benefited from this exchange, just as most of us, Charlie included, with all the cheap stuff that he's got in his room, has benefited from the cheaper prices that this international competition has brought to us. Tim, what about Tim here? Now, Tim correctly objected to all the machinations that was going on. He obviously feels hard done by, and most of us would agree. But you know, that's not the end of the story when the global economy changes the way that we've just seen. Tim's mom now has an additional 11 pounds sitting with her that she had originally set aside to get a clean car. She now has the clean car, thanks to Lauren. She's still sitting on an extra 11 pounds. And she could well decide to give Tim some extra pocket money this week. So even though Tim has been done out of his car wash gig, he's actually better off too from how the gains to the, the British consumer might be spread around what we're used to, the people around us, the people that we're used to. Moreover, we don't really know the situation with Lauren, or Lauren standing in for India and China. She tells us she likes shopping, she tells us that she likes to go out with friends, and all of that is right. But we don't know more about her background, and for all we know, she might have been wandering the street looking for a car wash job because we don't know. It might be that her dad has just lost his job. Now, that by itself shouldn't change the way we decided to give the car wash job to her rather than to Tim, but it does make us think differently about what happens in this great shift in the global economy. Now, one of the most complicated things that you and I have in our household our mobile phone. And our mobile phones are among the most complicated of objects that we routinely use that we don't know how to make ourselves. The modern mobile phone, whoops, I thought you told people to turn off their phones. Oh no, that's mine. Hello? Yeah, I can't talk now, I'm on the train. Text me. Okay, most of us actually use our mobile phones in a way similar to what I've just done. We hardly ever talk on the phone. What do we do with the phones? We play Angry Birds on it. We view YouTube videos. We look up street maps and we update Facebook and Twitter. Hardly any of us uses our phones to talk. And that makes us realize that a lot of the complicated things that we see around us, the value that's in them is in the creativity, the design, the ideas, the imagination that go into them and make them work the way they do. Very little of the value is embedded in the bits and bobs that are the physical thing of, that are the physical thing that make up a phone. This thing that comes to our hands has been made all over the world. If we just look across what's in this picture, I can see up here, it's got flash memory and display modules from Japan. It's got SD RAM from Korea. It's got an audio codec and Bluetooth chips from the United States. It is, when I turn over the back, designed in California and assembled in China. Global trade involves things that are so complicated 
that we couldn't make them ourselves, and they're actually made all over the world. But what matters that gives high value to these things are the creativity, ideas, and imagination. The eureka moment that makes something valuable. And that eureka moment is represented by a light bulb. Isn't it ironic that for almost all of the last 50 years, this traditional common light bulb used to represent innovation, ideas, and creativity is actually, well, actually quite boring until recently. Now, what we've seen happen is the emergence of, among other things, this wonderful British invention. This thing is called the Pluman light bulb. It uses 80% less energy than a normal incandescent light bulb. It lasts eight times longer. You have one of these babies in your house, it shows impact and presence. You can refer to it proudly as an ecological product with style. Now, the people who made this Pluman light bulb, the Pluman project, they're the makers of the world's first designer energy saving light bulb. And we're very fortunate this afternoon to have with us Michael George Hemus. A big round of applause, please, for Michael George. <laughs> Michael George. Thank you. Thank you. Is co founder and co director of the Pluman Project. And let me just tell you a few things about this project. Recently, Michael George and his associates have launched Pluman in the United States. Their work, their products are routinely talked about in sustainability blogs worldwide. I think of him as having single-handedly restored the status of the light bulb as the icon for creativity and imagination. So I think of him as an example for all of the young people of Britain today. So we've asked him here, we've invited him here to tell us a little bit about his work, perhaps to show us some of his projects and maybe perhaps give us some of it as parting, <coughs> wonderful parting <coughs> presents. But maybe not, we'll see. Michael George, tell us about the Pullman light bulb. How did you come up with the idea? We originally came up with the idea about uh, seven years ago. Not seven years ago, in 2007, sorry. Um, and it was very simple. It wasn't necessarily a massive eureka moment. It was more, we were looking at low energy light bulbs and everyone knows the benefits of them. Everyone knows that they save energy and they save people money, but no one really likes them because they were quite ugly, basically. And we thought it'd be nice to make something more sculptural that people would like. And so it's from there that we went out um, and started talking to manufacturers all over the world to try and work out how we can make something more beautiful, more sculptural that people would like. And indeed, you've made this very beautiful, as we could all see. And not just us. The Brit Insurance Design of the Year Award 2011 went to you and your company. And your product is displayed in museums. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing that you've achieved. Tell us about how you make these things. Where do you manufacture them? They're, they're all manufactured in China. We, um, the, I mean, the technology itself comes from America. The design comes from UK, but it was only possible to make it out in the Far East. Um, and in the end, the uh, factory that we end up using is in just north of Shanghai. The, you know, doing business in China. As you've been here, yeah. you've seen us talking about the Great Shift East. So you are yourself part of our global economy, part of this Great Shift East. Yeah. Can you, tell, can you tell the audience a little bit about the pros and cons of these decisions that you've made of manufacturing in China? Well, the, I mean, the pros are, are obvious. It's kind of as you've been talking about. You, you can make a product at a price that people in the UK or you know, in the West will, will be able to uh, pay for. If we would try to make these, say, in Germany, which is the only country in Europe that can make them, they'd probably be 80, 100 pounds each, and no one would buy them. And so you couldn't have the effect. Because mm. the idea of the uh, Pluman is to make people use low energy light bulbs because they want to. Mm. Um, so price is definitely one thing. Um, at the moment, most of, most of the world's light bulbs are made in China. We uh, couldn't actually make them here even if we wanted to because mm, we don't have those, that skill set mm. anymore. Mm. The cons, obviously, are that China is a long way away. Um, so you know we have to travel over there. Um, there's a lot of um, time difference that we have to work around. And obviously, there's a language and a cultural difference. And working around those cultural differences is you know, an important part in able, being able to make a good product. Mm. Excellent. And what, what you've shown us is actually how a complicated product like this designer light bulb is actually sourced in all different parts of the world. 
we're riding the wave of this great shift east in the global economy, but it is still ideas, creativity, and imagination that's put something like this together, and very successfully. Now, for want of a better term, I think of you as an entrepreneur. Can you tell our audience a little bit about what it means to be an entrepreneur and how you decided to do this? Uh, uh, to be, if you're an entrepreneur, it means that you have set up your own company and that you have set up on your own to solve a problem, create a, a service or a product, um, and build a business from scratch, basically. So you take an idea and you make it come to reality. Um, and yeah, I didn't know when I was 14 that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. In fact, I didn't know when I was 23 that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I just kind of, it's something that once I realized when I was 24 that it made sense that I wanted to start and, and give it a go. And um, it, I started by making uh, telephones for Skype. Um, and it kind of went from there, basically. Um, yeah. Amazing success. And many congratulations and continued success for your work. Thank Michael you very Charles, much. Everyone. An example to young people, not just in Britain, but everywhere. Now, we're coming almost to the end of our talk. We've learned about how design ideas and creativity matter. We've heard about collaboration with the manufacturing power that is out east. We've learned about the Great Shift East and the impact of global trade. And we've seen the effects of this Great Shift East on life here, on Charlie, on all of us who are buying things in the high street. To close out the lecture, let's cast our minds a little bit further out. Let's ask, what about life out east? What's it like there? Hang on a second. Just how many people are there out there in the east? Now, if I could have you turn to your clickers, because we're now going to address this exact question. How many people out the east are there for each of us here in the United Kingdom? Now, you see on this slide, if you think that the ratio is six, if you think there are six people out east for every one of us here in the UK, press the button one. If you think there are 20, press the button three. Polling is open now. And if you change your mind, change your guess, press the button again. So if you could all register. If I could display the results now, just how many? 3% of you think that there are six people out east for each of us. 29% of you think that there are 40 people out east for each of us. But the great majority, 33%, think there's 50. And that is indeed exactly the right answer. There are 50 people out east for the each of us. That makes us rethink our original idea, this great shift east in the global economy. It's coming hand in hand with there being a lot of people out there. So perhaps what we should be thinking about when we think about economic power is, yes, China, East Asia, they're now the world's second largest economies, but they have to take all this income and all this wealth and spread it across many different people. I want you to take a guess now. What is the income per person in China compared with the income per person elsewhere in the world? And you'll notice that I've divided the world's countries into teams. Team Grey, which is comprised of countries like the United States, well here, the United Kingdom and France, are the world's richest countries in terms of income per person, income per head. A second group, Team Purple, are the group of countries that are a little bit behind. The Brazil, the South Africa's, the Mexico's of the world, their income per head is just a little bit outside Team Grey's, and so on down. Team Blue is comprised of countries like Namibia, Azerbaijan, Fiji. Team Green, towards the bottom of this, is comprised of countries like Uzbekistan and Papua New Guinea. Now, if you could pick up your clicker units and take a guess, where do you think China or the East more generally, fits in these groups. Again, if you change your mind, just click again. And I will now call the polling to a close and display the results. 17% of you, almost one in five of you, think that China is now in the first team of richest countries in the world. And that's a really good guess, because China now is the world's second largest economy. It's overtaken us. So obviously, it, there's a good chance it belongs up there. Over a third of you thought that it belongs in Team Blue, in a group of countries like Namibia, 
Azerbaijan and Fiji? Let's display the right answer. The right answer turns out to be that given by Team Blue. So a big round of applause for all of you who correctly guessed Team Blue. OK, let's put some of this in perspective. The Great Shift East has occurred. China is rising in the ranks. But here's a sobering fact. Emerging Asia now, this East, has an average income that's only 1 20th the average income in the United States. Yes, they're rising, they're in the third group now, but they're still miserably poor. The average person in China is today poorer than his counterpart in Belarus, in El Salvador, and in Jamaica. In fact, the average East Asian today is poorer than the average African in nine economies across Africa. 30 years ago, China had 835 million people living in extreme poverty. That's almost 15 times the population of the United Kingdom. And when we say extreme poverty, what we mean is living on incomes less than 70p a day. Now, when you were waiting outside this lecture theater and you came in, many of you had your lunch. You had a nice sandwich, you had a nice juice to go with it, or a nice can of Coke. A can of Coke costs 70p. 30 years ago, China had 835 million people who lived on the same income and just that income. 70p a day is the kind of grinding poverty many of us will have had very little familiarity with. What does it mean? What it means is your house has no refrigerator. You do not have a flush toilet. There's no washing machine. The most valuable asset in your family is the livestock that you let into the ground floor of your house every evening, because otherwise that livestock will run away. Now, last year, there were one and a half billion people who lived in a situation like that. One quarter of these people still live out east. The east for all the rise remains very poor. But there's good news as well. 30 years ago, the world showed 2 billion people living in extreme poverty. And 30 years ago, half of these lived in the East. Rapid economic growth, openness to trade, participating in the global economy, all have brought hundreds of millions of people in the East out of extreme poverty. And this great shift East that we've just been discussing this afternoon, it's not just about the cheap stuff that comes into Charlie's bedroom, not just about the cheap stuff that we're able to buy on the high street. This Great Shift East has made the entire world immeasurably better off, and there's more to come. What about the original question that we started this lecture with? East beats West. What should we answer to that question? Now, I remember when I was a student, when I got questions on an exam that I didn't like, the thing that I wanted to do most of all was to go up to the teacher and tell him, hey, this is the wrong question. Well, guess what? You get to do now. You get to do that now. East beats West is the wrong question. What economics has done today in this afternoon's lecture is helped us understand some of these large changes in the world around us. And what you and I need to do is to continue to use economics to help improve the lot of humanity all around us. That is what economics is about, and that is how we should be viewing East Beast West. Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Thank you. <laughs>